I'll go through the presentation. Sorry. Then we will have time for question and answers uh, after it. I'll just have to hit got it here. Okay, so I'm going to do a presentation on reforestation in a stressful and uncertain climate. So the objective of the presentation is to provide some background uh, to current and future challenges to site restoration in definitely a warmer and drier climate. Things are changing. And to discuss a suite of different strategies and techniques that will increase the survivorship of seedlings. So first I'll go through some of the, the current and future challenges to reforestation. So one of the first things is that juvenile plants, small plants have a much lower environmental tolerance to drying and warming than uh, larger, more established plants with root systems. So that's uh, that's one of the challenges when you're planting small one or two year old seedlings. Uh, reclaimed sites uh, are often more stressful for seedlings. They're uh, more open, there's not as much protection. Uh, there's more variability in the climate in open sites. And you have a whole bunch of site limiting factors usually associated with those type of sites. And I'll get into those later. And uh, in a changing climate, warming and drying seedlings are stressed further warmer winters are really bad for seedlings as well it's better if winters just stay cold straight throughout and we don't get those warm days with drying winds which desiccate seedlings so i'm sure most of you know about the changing climate that we're in uh average temperatures have already increased globally 0 0.6 to 0.9 degrees celsius and in the prairie provinces, even more so, uh, 1.9 degrees Celsius since 1948. Uh, and in northern Canada, it's even worse, 2.3 degrees Celsius temperatures have gone up. And they're projecting, some of the models are projecting by 2100 in Canada, average temperatures are expected to increase 1.8 to 6.3 degrees Celsius, with winter temperatures going up as much as 2.5 to 10 degrees Celsius which is gonna be huge for, for trees and shrubs. Um, this rate of change uh, has little precedence. Uh, we have had warmings of five degrees Celsius that have happened over 5,000 years ago, but I'll show you a graph of some of the temperature projection scenarios that they're uh, looking at right now. So this RCP 8.5, Point five is sort of a high global emission scenario. That's if, if nothing changes, this red line by the time we hit the year 2100, which is what, 70, 78 years away or something like that, we could be upwards of four degrees Celsius in temperature change, which is gonna have a huge, huge impact on the tree seedlings. Uh, this little graph shows that it's not equitably distributed. Those were just averages I was presenting on the uh, last slide. You can see in the uh, the sort of the high global emission scenario versus low global emission scenario, a lot of the most extreme warning, well, warming, but it's all extreme, is going to be happening in uh, the north, basically. Oh, I should. Can you guys actually see my arrow when I move it there? Yep. Yeah, okay, good. Yeah, so Northern Canada is gonna be the most afflicted in either scenario, either high global emissions or low global emissions, but that aside, Alberta is, is gonna be afflicted either way. So you can see the large regional variations that occur. Uh, so there's there's two things going on. So there's climate and there's weather. And, you know, weather is a short-term mix of events. So, you know, some people may say, oh, it's freezing cold out. Where's the, the freezing cold out in the middle of January? Where's the uh, the warming? Well, climate, we have to look at climate, which is an average of both temperature and precipitation. And average temperature increases are going to lead to an increase in the severity of weather events. We're going to get all sorts of extremes, and we've already seen it. I was just talking to Rakshan about uh, drought and the forest fires. This year already in Alberta, we've lost over a million hectares of forest. That's 10,000 square kilometers of forest have burnt up. That's uh, 
we're we're in a record breaking year. The uh, I think the the last biggest amount was about one million forty thousand hectares that occurred in 1968, the Big Vega fire. We're going to blow away those records because this July we're in an El Nino year. They're calling for some record high summer temperatures, so we haven't seen anything yet. So yeah, drought, forest fires, not a good situation. Uh, hot and cold snaps and flooding and precipitation intensity. So we can expect all of these things. So it's going to be hard, hard on the trees and shrubs. And why it's hard on trees and shrubs and plants is because of the phenology of these plants. So phenology is sort of the timing of the life cycle events that the plants go through. You can see in this graph, you know, plants start uh, with flowering, the flower buds come out, then the buds flush and they start expanding. You get leaf expansion, wood formation. They stop growing, the buds set. Uh, you get senescence, leaves will start falling off and things like that. You'll get hardiness, frost hardiness, cold hardiness built up. And then the plants will go into dormancy. The issue with changing climates is that plants have very narrow windows of requirements they need. They need a certain number of chilling hours to go through in the fall so that they'll break dormancy in the spring and the buds will flush out again and the uh, the flower buds will flush out. And if you start getting huge variations in climate and warming and drying, it's going to mess with the plant's phenology and they might not flower, they might not bud out, they might not go into dormancy properly. It's going to stress the plant's uh, a huge amount. Uh, there's going to be mortality associated with it, so it's not a not a good scene. And obviously, some plants are more adaptable to changes in climate than others. And I'll go through some of the plants that are more hardy and more adaptable. And I've already talked about this. So though plants are adapted to a climate, extreme weather events can fall outside of the average and disrupt plants development. So bud development, seedling shoot development, seedling hardening and dormancy that I talked about, all parts of plant phenology cycles. Uh, in Alberta, we currently have 90 seed zones and that limits the movement of plant material and seeds to distinct geographical areas. So for example, if I want to plant plants in the Martin Hills area, which is just east of Slave Lake here, I can only collect seed and deploy it within this, this narrow region, which is uh, basically uh, like an, an ecosite type, uh, an Alberta ecosite. Uh, and the reason they came up with these seed zones originally is because they wanted to make sure that the genetics were adapted to the specific ecocytes and to the area, and it's legislated. But this might be setting us up for some problems in the future because we're limiting some genetic diversity when we're planting material that only originates from some of these small seed zones when the climate's changing so rapidly. Probably what we want is probably we want a lot broader diversity of plants and seed being deployed up here. So we have stuff that's adapted to more drying and warming. So now I'm gonna go through some of the uh, challenges to reforestation and reclaimed sites. So Obvious one is, like I mentioned before, wide open exposed sites, limited shelter and limited microsites. Like this is a pretty homogeneous site, pretty flat. And that that's hard on trees, hard on trees for drying, hard on trees for frost and a, a number of things. Uh, limited organic matter or LFH lab, uh, layers. Certainly more organic matter in the soil is better for all sorts of things from a nutrition perspective, from frost heaving perspectives, from compaction perspectives. Competition, uh, a lot of these sites end up getting overgrown with weeds and I'll talk about that a little bit later and that can really adversely affect plants and soil compaction, like I mentioned as, as well. So silviculturalists have a number of different tools that they can try to use to deal with some of these things. Uh, 
So in a changing climate, there's a few things we can do. Uh, we can plant a diversity of species. So not just one monoculture, we can plant mixtures of conifer, deciduous, shrubs, a variety of different species. That's, that's one good strategy for sure. Uh, we can try to get broader, more resilient genetics. So again, rather than deploying one narrow seed zone, I'll show you we can deploy trees that basically have been collected or seed that's been collected from a lot broader region, uh, breeding regions, we call them in Alberta. And I'll show you some of that, some of that a little later. Site limiting factors. We can do site preparation and maintenance of the trees to, to try to alleviate some of the site limiting factors that I went through earlier, things like, things like compaction. Um, and timing, the project of the timing, uh, the timing of the project has huge uh, implications on how well seedlings establish and grow. And if your timing is out of schwack, it can put the seedlings under tremendous stress and not turn out well. So the first one, diversity. So this picture here on the right, you can see there's a diversity of species that are planted on this site. There's there's shrubs, there's conifer trees, there's deciduous trees. Um, so certainly in a changing climate, we want more resiliency by planting a diversity of species. And I, I listed here some of the drought resistant trees and shrubs that we have available to us in Alberta that are, are can take more as far as drought and uh, drying, lodgepole pine, the pines, the lodgepole pine and jack pine, Manitoba maple, Russian olive, junipers, buffalo berry and silverberry, very uh, drought resistant species. Saskatoon can take a lot. Roses, uh, prickly rose, lilacs, sea buckthorn are all good choices for species that are able to take a lot more drying and heat. Uh, the sort of things that we're expecting to run into. So I mentioned seedling genetics. Uh, so improved seed does exist for lots of the pine and the spruce in Alberta. And what I mean improved seed, I'm not talking genetically modified seed. I'm just talking seed where foresters went out and they identified best looking, best form, tallest, strongest looking spruce trees, for example, they collected them, collected basically the tops, the tops of those trees and grafted them onto rootstock and produced seed from those. So you can see this, this light green area, this is a breeding region and you can see it encompasses like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, or eight of those seed zones. So you have a much broader range of diversity of genetics. Uh, and when you basically take those trees that are produced from orchard produced seed from basically the best out there as far as trees in a broad geographical area, you get better genetic diversity, which is, which is a good thing in a changing climate. You want as much genetic diversity as possible. Site preparation, uh, things you can do to improve the micro site for the seedling so it'll establish and grow. You want to you want to deal with site limiting factors, particularly if you're going into a changing climate. Here you can see a, a little pine seedling next to some coarse woody debris, which actually offers some protection for the plant. Things like that are really good. So again, there's coarse woody debris. What happens is during the day, uh, heat is absorbed into that coarse woody debris. And then at night, this coarse woody debris basically radiates long wave heat back out. And the plant, in this case, a spruce tree, does not have to use its resources just trying to sustain itself in harsher climates. It can actually put more of its carbohydrates and resources into growing when you have things like coarse woody debris next to it. Mounding is another thing. You can create artificial microsites to plant trees in. Uh, this is a, a Denarin mounder, a line mounder that creates raised microsites, which are important in the case of sites that are too wet, where your limiting factor is excessive soil moisture 
trees and shrubs need oxygen in the soil. So if it's a saturated soil, uh, plants that are planted in that aren't going to thrive very well. But if it's a super dry site, you can also plant in the bottom of the, uh, the mound hole or on the hinges as well. So there's different areas. It gives you different microsites to plant the plants on depending on what you think your climate is going to be like in the future. Competition is another another big one. Uh, yeah, you don't need plants accruing additional stress because every stress event that a plant or a tree accrues is cumulative. So competition, uh, that's a stress on a plant. Soil compaction is a stress on a plant. Mechanical damage is a stress on a plant. Every time that stress accumulates, it adds on and adds on until eventually you get to the point where the plant either dies or it just barely hangs on. Um, so you want, you want to deal with competition. And these are all sites that we've been asked to plant for oil and gas companies. And you can just see like sweet clover, there's the planting shovel. No, no plant is going to survive under this. This is like Calamagrostis canadensis, marsh reed grass. Obviously, no plant is going to going to survive in that environment planted under that. So, to alleviate that, you can do mechanical site preparation, different uh, mechanical techniques to get rid of the competition. You can use herbicides. You can do spot spraying, or you can do a mixture of both. So that's another another thing to consider. You're setting yourself up for failure if you're planting in super competitive sites. Uh, compaction is a is another one. This picture of these shovels are actually our tree planter shovels coming back from a, an oil and gas reclamation site. They physically bent the shovels trying to open the planting holes. You know that no tree or plant is going to survive or establish in a situation like that where the soil is that compacted. You need water permeability. You need oxygen down there. You need the plant to be able to extend its roots. And there's different techniques. This technique that you see here is uh, a sub, a winged subsoiler that actually decompacts the soil. And in this case, they've pulled some coarse woody debris onto the site as well. It'd be nice to see more, but uh, at least there's some there. So these are all things we can do to help alleviate the microclimate and some of the site limiting factors that'll help in changing climates. And then just uh, the planting regime as well. Um, so conifers, uh, generally you wanna try to plant those in more protected areas if you have a choice because they can often suffer from winter desiccation damage because they have their needles on the plant all winter. And if you get warming winters and drying winds, those can actually desiccate the foliage, the stomata on the needles open, the ground is still frozen, they can't suck up new moisture and they desiccate. So it's nice to get the conifers in protected areas. Deciduous because they shed their leaves during the uh, winter can be planted in more exposed areas because they won't desiccate as much as the conifer trees. Uh, drought tolerant species generally plant those on higher ground and plants that are less drought tolerant plant those on lower ground. And another thing, uh, just up your planting density because you're going to expect higher rates of mortality in a changing climate. So you can change your planting regime. And then timing. Everything has to work and come together when you're doing a project. There's no sense preparing a site, doing like a, a winged subsoiler to decompact a site. If your trees aren't ready and it can't be planted till two years after the fact, because you're going to get competition coming up. Um, and also trees that are produced have certain periods of time when they should be planted in order to thrive. There's spring trees that are dormant. They have a very narrow window to be planted. There's summer trees uh, that uh, basically have ceased top growth, but will have root growth. There's a very specific time to plant those. So you have to make sure that everything lines up with your, your project because you want to put as little stress as possible on the trees. And deciduous plants, generally you don't want to plant leaf on deciduous in the heat of the summer 
Uh, you plant the plant, the roots haven't had time to egress into the surrounding soil and take up moisture. You have a huge transpirational demand from the leaves, and the leaves typically just shrivel up and fall off and die because uh, you're way better planting deciduous in the spring in a dormant stage and allowing the plant to leaf out. So I just have uh, yeah, two slides left, the summary. Um, so as we all know, the climate's already changed and it's gonna continue to do so. We've seen it with some of these big fires. Uh, plants are adapted to a range of environmental factors and they do risk falling outside of their desired range with the changing climate. And to reduce the risk of failure, there's several options. Like I said, reduce site limiting factors, create microsites, increase species diversity and increase the genetic diversity. And there's the references and there's my contact information. Um, so we have four different web pages. Like I said, that's our not-for-profit. Tree Time Services does planting and silviculture services. Treetime.ca actually sells uh, shelter belt species and other trees and shrubs online. And coast-to-coast -coast reforestation are the big reforestation nurseries that we market for and do 60 million seedlings annually. So I'll leave it at that. And if you guys have any questions, I'd be happy to field them. Great. Thank you so much for that presentation, Scott. Um, but yeah, if uh, if you have any questions or thoughts that you'd like to share with Scott, uh, please feel free to raise your hand using the Zoom function or feel free to put it in the chat. Yeah, and it doesn't have to be related to the presentation as well if you have any tree-related questions. Uh, Go Megan, ahead, Megan. Megan. Hello, um, I want to ask if you have any more specific recommendations of what timing might be best. Uh, we usually um, either end up with a spring or a fall planting, um, but even are there certain months that are better that you'd recommend? We're, we're located, as I said, around Edmonton. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, so definitely if you're going to have a, a diversity of species deciduous, I would recommend spring. Um, because you don't want to generally put the deciduous leaf on. Spring, I find, is a better option than fall as well. The, the fall you can get away with if the soil moisture conditions are good. But the problem with fall planting is you put the tree or the plant in the ground and it hasn't got a lot of time for its roots to egress into the surrounding soil prior to the onset of winter. And then you can start running into problems with desiccation of the plant through the winter. You can uh, run into problems with frost heaving where in fine textured soils like clays and silts, uh, the frost actually heaves the plant out of the soil because its roots haven't anchored it into the soil. You don't run into that with spring planting. So I, I do like spring planting. So basically planting dormant stock uh, in the spring. So basically like a deciduous plant with no leaves, a conifer plant that hasn't broken bud and elongated yet, and they'll do that in the spring. Uh, with conifers, you can plant them in the summer, though, as well. Uh, basically, we artificially black the, the trees out, so they artificially set bud, and they start building up wax on their needles, so they haven't got the soft, supple growth. And those can be planted in the summer or fall, the conifer. But if you're mixing deciduous and conifer together, I would definitely recommend spring dormant planting. So May and June. And you don't want to plant much less, much later than June 20th. The problem if you're planting later than June 20th is the, the freshly planted trees, uh, for one, they get so out of sync with the natural trees because you plant a tree and it usually takes about two weeks to flush out and elongate after you planted it. So all of a sudden you're having that soft supple growth grow up during like July or the heat of the summer and you can often get it desiccated and flagged down. Uh, and at that time, the, nat the native trees have already stopped their growth and they're already starting to harden and set bud. So, so I would say May up till June 20th is what I'd recommend for spring. Perfect, thanks. If if we do have some fall planting, do you have any recommendation for either timing or anything else to watch for? Uh, it, it's it's hard because uh, you can get away with fall planting. It's 
if you have good soil moisture conditions. Um, if you, yeah, if you don't, it can be hard on the trees. But yeah, fall planting, if you do do it, you'd probably want to get it done, you know, September, mid-October. You don't want to push it too close to the, the winter window. You want to give the plant at least some time to get some lateral root egress into the surrounding soil. So usually when you're doing a fall plant, again, the, the top of the seedling is already hardened or it's already dormant, but often the roots are still active. So you'll still get a period of time where the roots can egress into the surrounding soil. But if you're doing a fall plant, like end of October, you're going to get very limited time for the roots to egress into the surrounding soil prior to the onset of winter. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, great. Um, Julie, I noticed you had some questions in the chat. I was wondering if you... Oh, sorry. I didn't see those. To... Uh, I can't see the chat. I'll, I'll just yeah. say them out loud. Um, okay. If you, you were talking about planting uh, trees or seeds, um, in particular seed zones of Alberta, and mm -hmm. then you were saying that for extra help for hardiness and for survival, that it might be a good idea to bring other... Um, trees and seeds from a different zone to help Ge the biodiversity would genetics those, yeah yeah would those trees brought in from another zone would they become invasive like is, would you have to put in a plan for uh, a possibility of invasiveness and taking out the native plants then or or with climate change do you see that as not being a problem that that would be more advantageous yeah what i was what i was suggesting is not bringing in like uh, exotic species but the same species so lodgepole pine for example uh, rather than planting lodgepole pine just from a very narrow geographic location, bring in lodgepole pine, particularly from areas to the south. And the government's starting to allow us to do more and more of that. We can put in variance requests, and they are allowing us to take, uh, for example, same species from southern and lower uh, altitudes and move them up in elevation or north because they're recognizing the importance of getting genetic diversity and not uh, having very narrow seed zones. So so yeah, usually moving southern, southern, uh, the same species from the south to the north and from low elevation to high elevation will help, uh, help the plants have a better genetic diversity and better adapted to warming, drying climates. Good answer. Thank you so much. And then in one of your listing, you had quite a few plants that I recognize as being native to Alberta, but Russian olive was one of them. And I know that that one's an invasive species in eastern Canada. So as climate change rises in Alberta, would that be something to worry about or that would be so far in the future? It's not too worried. Yeah, I, I particularly, I know it can be evasive uh, along waterways and stuff like that, particularly in southern Alberta. But when it's planted as an individual tree um, uh, away from some of those waterways, it's a very drought tolerant and a very beautiful silver leafed tree. So uh, I, I, I personally like Russian olive. I kept Caragana off the list. Caragana is another invasive one, but very drought tolerant and uh, can take a lot. So Caragana will often grow where nothing else will grow type of thing. Mm -hmm. So it, we might have no choice but to use plants like that if things really start getting dry and hot, if we want some sort of ground cover. Interesting. Yeah. And then when you were talking about preparing the site and going into the soil and uh, you had some really good ideas for the mounding and things, but I was thinking for one of our sites here, it's very compacted. We're actually looking at uh, planting in a in a power line right away, and mm -hmm. and uh, so we were contemplating that to prepare the soil, a good measure possibly might be to just cover the whole soil with area with cardboard and then put um, compost on top of that and let it sit for a year, and then after that, um, go to because that might even preserve, preserve some moisture and it would take out some of the existing invasive um, orbs that are in the power line because power lines are notorious for that. But yeah. there is quite a lot of success for planting right away in the U.S. and eastern Canada. So would that be a good thing or is it better to bring in soil from another place, which would be more advantageous, do you think? 
sorry, did you say what type of material would you be putting and how deep? Uh, well, just actually right on the surface of what's there, just cover it in cardboard and then cover that in mulch. And then maybe a year later, um, mulch like, like, like bark, with... bark mulch or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And then after that, start with the community garden, like sort of a three sisters permaculture thing to get the soil even more prepared for a, a reforestation planting thing. And it's a pipeline, you said, right? A pipeline uh, right away? Power line. Power line a power right line away. right away. But we also have a pipeline right away to restore as well. We have both. Yeah. What a, hmm. What I would be concerned about is first of all, what's what's the soil substrate like originally there? Like is all have all the organics been scraped off in the forest floor? Is it pure mineral soil prior to putting that mulch, that cardboard and that mulch on? Uh, um, like have they pulled back strippings and organic material already or incorporated it, or is it just pure like clay it's, or yeah, it's fairly clay e soil. And it's sort of been just ignored for 50 years. So nothing's been done to strip and, it. And it's the super thing... compacted, you said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. And we would were trying I... to think, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, what I, I'm just thinking, I, again, I haven't seen the site or assessed it, but what I'm thinking is I think you'd be way better off trying to incorporate, if you can, some organics into that mineral soil and decompact it. So if you can somehow get some strippings or some peat or something like that and subsoil it with a mm -hmm. like a subsoiler ripper to decompact it and at the same time incorporate organic material into the soil mm -hmm. i think that would be better mm -hmm. uh sometimes putting mulch like that just on a, a, a pure clay soil i don't think that's going to get you much further ahead mm -hmm. um and then you don't really want to mix big chunks of wood and bark into the soil because what happens is soil microbes will try to break down that bark and they'll suck whatever nitrogen is in the soil out of it. They'll immobilize the nitrogen and you'll have yellow, sick looking plants. Um, yeah, I think you have to try to get some sort of organics or st strippings back onto the site. If you can, sometimes it's not possible. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That's good to know. Yep, yeah, uh, Megan, go ahead. Hello. Um, so uh, a lot of times we're planting in areas uh, with quite a bit of tall grass. Um, I know you mentioned that um, when there's competition, um, you can you can spray or remove um, other plants. I was wondering if you had any specific recommendations for what we could do um, against grass. Yeah, so, yeah, certainly uh, there's a few things. You can do mechanical site preparation. So mounding is a good good treatment with grass. You saw some of the mounding where you basically flip over an inverted mound and you basically typically have like a mineral soil cap that's two to four inches thick and then the organic is trapped beneath the mound. That'll give relief from competition for a number of years. And it creates like a, a a spot, almost a tunnel for the plant to be on. So that's that's one thing you can do. Uh, there's other treatments you can do. You can do blading treatments. Uh, that's another type of mechanical treatment. You can do deep ripping treatments. That's another one. Uh, and herbicide treatments, definitely. I know a lot of people don't like herbicides, but you can do spot herbicide treatments. You can use... Uh, chemicals like amazapir, you can use chemicals like glyphosate to, to kill the grass and uh, and then plant as well. But you have to do something with that competition. If you have uh, super thick grass competition, uh, something has to be done because you just can't, if you plant trees in there, you're just wasting your, your money, right? Seedlings, they just, they get pressed and they just get out competed and they don't stand to hope. Yeah. Thanks very much. Great, thank you. And uh, yeah, I'm just wondering if anyone else has any uh, last questions or thoughts to share. Yeah, just as a matter of interest, do you know if with the forest fires that we're experiencing in Alberta, and there's even some in Northern Saskatchewan, I'm in Saskatoon, yep. uh, do you know if the majority of fires 
were were human caused or lightning or arcing or something else? I think in the spring, the vast majority of them are, are human caused. They usually start with grass fires of some sort, either some embers fall off the muffler of a quad or an all-terrain vehicle or someone flicks a cigarette butt out of the window or someone's not careful with a campfire or usually the spring fires are usually human caused in most cases as you get later in the season and you start getting lightning storms and buildups and stuff like that with lots of lightning then you can start getting into lightning caused fires um usually through the summer when you have the storms. At, at the end of the year, when they look at fire stats, it's typically about half and half. Half the fires are caused by humans, half are caused by lightning strikes. But in the spring, it's mostly human caused. Thank you. Yeah. Is there a great way to mitigate or increase the public education about it? Because I notice quite often um, right now and, and the last couple of years, there's a lot of um, information going to the public and in the news media after the forest fires are starting and people are being evacuated. Uh, and the old campaigns of the, like Smokey the Bear, only you can prevent forest fires, all those preventative or words to the community that might go up ahead of time. I don't hear about them. Are those still implemented by anybody? I'm not sure about Saskatchewan. I know Alberta, they have like... Uh a public relations division of the forest service that goes out with uh, trailers and promotional material and they hand out like canvas buckets and they're trying to get the message across like uh, be careful make sure you put your fires out be careful with your quads and your atvs um and when things get really bad, what they did in Alberta is they just instituted a province-wide uh, ATV ban. And they were actually even considering in Alberta before this rain doing a province-wide forest ban where they wouldn't even allow recreationalists into the various areas. They never went through with that. But uh, those are some of the tools at their disposal. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what Saskatchewan does. I, I have seen the Alberta folks out at different trade shows and stuff like that, trying to get the message across. Um, ATVs actually can be quite uh, dangerous starting fires. You get moss and stuff built up around the mufflers and the people don't even know, right? They're driving out there and there's dry grass and uh, some uh, am muffler of organic material that's built around their muffler and next to a, a grass fire starts into a forest fire. That's yeah. true. Cool. Thank you. Didn't know that. Yeah. Great. Um, any uh, other questions or comments before we wrap up? Oh, I see the chat now. Let's yeah. see. Was there anything in the chat that wasn't covered? I think Julia's asked all the questions from the chat. Okay. But uh, yeah, if there's a, yeah, if there's anything we missed, if there's anything that's been missed, or if there's any more questions or comments to share, please do so. Um, yeah, and people, uh, you feel free to reach out to me at uh, my email or my number there if you have any questions. Yeah, thank you for all your knowledge. It was very much appreciated. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Scott, for your presentation.